Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Hello, I'm Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone Podcast. I appreciate you for listening. Today's guest is outstanding. His name is Bob Fechtow. He's the CIO of SAIC. SAIC is a 15,000 employee, $4 billion plus publicly traded company. And Bob is actually, this is his second time on the show. He's really got an interesting perspective on the role of the CIO. And I think you all need to hear it. And I loved it listening to him because he's it's very interesting, his perspective and ideas on the profession. He's one of the top four people in his company who reports about company performance on Wall Street. So the other is being the CEO, CFO, and COO. And he signs off on all the SOX controls for his company as well. From my perspective of working with and interviewing hundreds of CIOs, he is visionary and he's one of the best in his profession. But more importantly, he's a giver. And he wants to give back to the profession and share his wisdom. And I appreciate that. And I think you all will as well. Here are a few highlights from our conversation. But before I get into those highlights, you know, who is this appropriate for? This conversation really rings whether you're early, just getting started in your CIO journey, whether you're mid-career or if you're a late-career CIO, with as long as you still got gas in the tank, <laughs> you'll benefit from listening to this conversation. Some of the quick wins that you're going to get from this are he paints a visionary picture of the art of the possible. What I mean by that is he talks about how a CEO needs to paint the picture of, it, of the art of possibility. His perspective of the role of the CIO in finance is a must listen to. So the title of this podcast and blog post is how to win as a CIO and financial leader. So Obviously, it's pretty important, this section on finance in the CIO. His perspective, how he uses labor and time savings to calculate ROI and TCO calculations for his technology investments. Very, very cool. What it means to him to be state of the art versus state of the market with his investments. We discuss his role with compliance. I think this is an interesting interesting dynamic with the CIO and compliance moving forward. And he has opinions about this, which are very, very, very important. We discussed his belief in the role of the CIO and in innovation, and it's not what you think. <laughs> we also review the top three skills a CIO must have, analytical, financial, and communication. What it means to own a problem, capital O, capital W, capital N. And the important CIO tools he uses Basically, I would call them ERPs for CIO and also an interesting project management system. And you'll be able to find links to these right on the site at uh, redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. And you can find links to these products we're talking about. So I can go on and on. I found it very difficult to summarize kind of the takeaways because I warn you, you're going to need a pencil and paper. You're going to want a pencil and paper for this one or go to the website and read it yourself if you're better at uh, reading fast and listening to this. But let's get into this. So feedback, go on to Twitter at R-F-E-C-T-E. Find Bob on Twitter at R-F-E-C-T-E. And he wants to be communicated with on Twitter and uh, please leave comments on iTunes as well for the show. So now let's get into my wide-ranging discussion with Bob Fechtow, CIO of SAIC. Welcome you back again to the show. Oh, it's great to actually be on the show. I, I found it to be a really proactive event the last time we did it. Well, good. You're one of the first couple guests from a couple years ago. So it's it's good to have you return back on the show. And, you know, it's one of the one of the things we talked about prior or just a couple weeks ago, kind of prepping for this was the the role of the the CIO and the stability discipline of the profession. And you had sort of a you have some really strong opinions about kind of the consistency of the discipline of being a CIO. And maybe we could start out there. Sure. I think one of the things that's really important for everyone to understand 
At the beginning of the day, the CIO function is literally only about 16 years old. It's coming now up on its 17th year. We've had three generations of education cycles that have come out of the universities that have actually produced true CIOs that are fully skilled at information resource management at the enterprise level. And, and part of that is because, you know, the original charters started in 1998, and as they progressed, you know, you started with the concept, it gets chartered in the law, in the federal government anyway, and then the functions fill them with talented people. But in the beginning of the CIO cycle, you, you had cycles that were only 18 months long, and mostly because it takes about a year for you to figure out whether the guy running the whole program has the skill or doesn't have the skill. So they're generally one-year decisions, and they, you kind of have to live with them. And then the next six months, you figure out what it takes to actually replace the CIO. And part of the problem in that during that cycle is they weren't trained. Education programs came online around 2000, and while there were tech office people from the back office of the IT coming forward to lead, they hadn't received any education on how to manage the complexity of what technology investments really mean to a company. So consequently, they had a high turnover rate. As education came on board, and as we have seen more and more uh, people trained in full-scope information resource management, we're starting to see the careers trail out to like four to six years now. Like I've been in this position four years, and I had been in the previous position eight years. But that mostly has to do with the fact that I was trained as a CIO in the federal government. So I think that's one aspect of the CIO function that I would talk to you about that really has made a difference in the value of the role within the company. The second part is defining what the CIO is responsible for. Technically, the CIO is one of the three C leads in the company, the chief executive officer, the chief operating officer, and the chief financial officer. The CIO is the fourth one. And literally, he actually signs on the execution documents for SOX control for publicly traded companies. And one of the reasons that's so, uh, so important is because I'm in a compliance role as the CIO here. And that's a very important feature of what the responsibility in the corporate world is about. I have to certify to the stockholder that we're in a secure environment, that our systems are online, and that they work properly and I'm also responsible for making sure those systems calculate the revenue properly for the business. So as you can see, it's a very complicated kind of role. The other piece that's really important to me is I have total responsibility for the IT spend. It doesn't mean they spend all the IT. It just means that one of the key features and functions of a CIO is to understand where all the costs for IT originate from and be able to categorize those organize those, and then report back to the business in an authoritative way what the total technology investment is to make the business run. And from that total knowledge picture, you can then categorize it into managed or unmanaged. You've heard the term shadow IT. That's generally IT that's outside of the purview or view of the uh, CIO's direct control or authority, but it's still a responsibility that the CIO owns. So in that case, I kind of define the role as all-encompassing. And I think the last piece that's really interesting is that we're responsible for understanding how technology can better support the business. And that takes you from the response types IT department into the proactive IT department of delivering technology so the business can operate better by using your talent, skills, and capabilities to improve the way the business operates. It includes business process analysis, it includes technology research and investment concepts, and it really talks about developing business cases that really the business can understand in the vernacular and communication style they're accustomed to in terms of return on investment, total cost of ownership, and continued trail and tail of expenses. So in that way, as we walk out towards the future, when you walk into a company, the CIO function is generally not consistently defined from one business or industry to another, yet the skill is actually consistent and defined. So one of the key things that I have a real gripe on lately is that we are consistent with the artifacts that are necessary to understand how the CIO runs in an office or in a company. And the key thing for that is it's consistency and consistent artifacts. When the COO goes in, 
to take over a new job in a company, he generally looks at the project schedule programs that are red, green, and yellow, and he looks at the pipeline to understand how many future contracts he's going to have to support. And if it's a production-type company, what is the production rate? What's the optimum desire for the business? And what's the lagging orders? And can they fulfill the orders in the time that they're contracted for? If you're the CFO, you can pretty much get the handle on most of the business in a couple of days. You look at the financial management programs. The first one you worry about is, you know, what's the general ledger say? The total value of the company. Then when you walk down that path, you say, okay, what's the accounts receivable? How many orders are outstanding? And then what is the pipeline of orders and structures in the future? From that point, within a day or two, you can probably get a pretty good assessment with the business of how strong it's going to be, where it could be, and where you can start to connect to it. In the IT space, we have no consistency. And one of the things that I try to do is focus on consistency, starting at an asset management or asset tracking kind of capability. We own probably the largest capital investment in the company as the IT department. And understanding where it is, how many you have, and what technology they're running on seems to be a really good foundational place to start doing it so that you can manage and help the business guide its investments into the future with the technology stack. So I think when you start talking about the history of the CIO, the role of the CIO, and the maturity of the CIO, we're starting to talk about that. But one of the things that we as an industry have to do is we have to clearly define what is the artifacts that should be in the company when a CIO arrives so that they can be most effective at getting to the future as opposed to trying to track down where everything is when they, when they get on board. So I know it's kind of like I kind of see some disconnect between maybe how the CIO role had been done before, kind of do whatever you can to make everything work, to where it should be going in the future. Does that kind of answer your question? Well, it does. And I would like to dive into a couple of the terms that you use, just so because I think some of the folks that are listening, maybe we need to uncover what it means to have an artifact, because I often hear that, you know, the CIO will be involved in budgeting and planning, like they'll prepare their budget for the year. And that's completely different from what you and I are talking about, as far as having, like the CFO in the business has a complete advantage in the fact that they have a generally accepted accounting principles, gap accounting principles. They have an AICPA that governs, as long as people are ethical and honest, putting data in from CFO all the way down to uh, the bookkeepers entering data. There's a certain way of putting in data so that the business can understand the health of the organization from a financial point of view, but that doesn't exist on the IT side. So maybe we could start Well, it there. exists, but I don't think it's standard. Okay. I mean, it's not a, there's no common practice. So you know, the concept of doing common? asset management is critical so that you can understand where it is and where you're going to go to. That's, it's a fundamental of, of IT architecture. But, you know, how to describe and how to list the assets arrayed against costs, which I think is a standard that everybody should start with, isn't part of the discipline that we're taught. You know, we're taught a whole bunch of things like program management, project management. We're taught about, you know, maybe finances and how the finance connects to uh, budget. But connecting IT directly to the effectiveness and efficiency of the business and where its impact and how those costs, that's all part of the, a total information resource management concept. But, but what do you mean by that? Like, can we give an example? What would a, be a practical way? So it's oh, we're starting the beginning of the year. And if someone wanted to start over with a different, I mean, I hear this constantly. I hear, I, I wish I were better financially so I could go toe to toe with the CFO. This is a common weakness that honestly is a, um, I think people try to hide behind or they don't hide behind and just it becomes a weakness. So where would, where would one get started? Well, one starts well before the budget of the business. So let me give you an example. The budget for the business is declared in a planning process. And one of the key, since IT is generally the largest expense and most expensive components of the business after human capital, it's incumbent on the IT department to put together a really predictive cost about what next year is going to cost to run. That includes managing the licenses. It includes understanding how many assets you're going to buy. It it really does matter about how you manage depreciation. 
the schedules and everything else for double declining depreciation concepts under the GAAP accounting rules. You also have to understand the complexity between expense and capital investment. Capital gets depreciated. A very interesting thing, I'm limited to how much capital I can spend by how much depreciation I'm able to carry on a fixed budget for five years after the investment. So understanding how those business cases tie together so that you can achieve a return on investment when you buy a technology is incumbent on the skills of the CIO. Understanding the asset, understanding its value, when does it come out of value, and when does it have to be reinvested. And then you tie into that the complexity of vendor support. Vendors will rotate technology in, out to your inventory that you may own, and then at some point in time, maybe before the depreciation is completed, they'll start to say, we're going to unsupport that stuff. And if they're critical business systems, you can't let that happen as a CIO. So those are the foundations for how the big investment budgets start. And then the second part is the operations and maintenance. How many patches have to be put on? What is the number amount of labor that takes? Can you build a work breakdown structure for all your labor force? so that you can accurately predict what it's going to cost to run you the next year. Once you figure that out and you can give a fixed cost of run with good estimates to the business, the business can now take that and defray those costs as a foundational operational piece so that they can predict what kind of impact their contracts and contract wins will have on the total budget. If I can give you a cost that says, look, you can plan on it costing – $6,000 per person per year for total IT support, hold me accountable for that, then you can start planning how much business you have to run to pay that bill and answer your profit goals, your growth objectives, and the margins in the business for uh, labor management. That's why it's essential that a CIO, he can't be just an IT guy. He's got to understand all the components of a business. That makes sense. And that's what you're referring to when you say artifacts. Is that correct? What, the, what are the consistent artifacts? You're saying that they must understand all of the pieces, but that's not consistent from company to company. Is that what you're saying is a, is a weakness within the profession? Is that a CIO? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. You can go to another company like Boeing or Lockheed, or you can go to, or probably not them, but you can go to a mid-market company and the way they manage the expectations there of IT, that CIO is going to come completely with it to a different landscape of what's expected. Is that correct? That's correct. So it's not the expectation. It's probably the skill of the CIO, number one. And number two, if they don't have a methodology, a consistent methodology to operate, startup time is extended. So it could be 120 days before they get their feet on the ground. One of the key functions the CIO is responsible for is to painting the visionary picture of what's the art of the possible with inside of an O&M run rate. And then if you want to make alterations to that art, what would an investment do to it? Is the investment going to jump you up the stack and get you something more? If so, how do you calibrate and quantify what that more is so that you can talk to the business back in terms of its understanding, returns on investment, total cost of ownership? How is the ROI calculated? What are the net values? Are they tangible or intangible costs? Does it decrease labor if we implement a new solution? Does it make the labor more flexible? Or does the process increase in speed? So there's a whole bunch of ways to measure it. I tend to measure things by time and labor. So if I decide to do an investment in a technology that takes out 10 people out of the foundation support infrastructure of the company, and it also increases the speed with which people can do their job, then the ROI calculations are calculable against known standards. Take the average labor, for instance, the average labor cost per person, average salary, you divide that out into minutes, and if you knock 10 minutes per person off per year, well, over 15,000 people, that's a lot of money. And so the ROI closes very quickly. So you're saying 2,000 out potential working hours per year per person, and then you're just dividing that into the minutes per person, correct? And then, correct. Um, and then dividing that into the savings that you're expecting to achieve. Is that how you're coming up with that math? That's how we do it. Okay. And then here's the, here's the thing. First work, first work is done by the minute rate. But it's like a 200% increase to do rework. When you find a mistake, go fix the mistake, and then have the person redo it. So there's a training component and a clarity purpose component that comes into the fielding of technology. 
you know, if you can reduce the error rates at the initial site, the repair is much less expensive. So simple solutions that do very effective work with minimal error are key elements to your business case. I'm going to take this another step. But so quickly moving through a project versus more of like a, a long tail waterfall style project. Is that the way I'm interpreting that? No, not at all. I mean, you can deliver very quick incremental agile solutions that are all tied to a future division, as long as what you're delivering builds on each other and, and it's concise and it's clear what people have to do. For instance, email is easy to do. You can do an upgrade to email, but there's no generally, that's an O&M function without ROI. But if you were going to add on a tool on the email, you'd want to quantify what that tool does and what's the value you expect to get it. And then it can be measured against people's performance. That's a better way to look at it. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And you've often said that to me, at least that the CIO, what the business thinks is important versus what the CIO thinks is important <laughs> are two different things, but you have a, if you have a pretty clear opinion about that, maybe you could share that with us. Yeah. So that's, that's really important. My pro, one of the prime responsibilities the CIO has to the business is the business builds a strategy and that is about running the business, growing in the pers- perspective expanding its market space, et cetera. But the CIO's responsibility is to take that vision and view and translate it to an IT strategy and vision that we can quantifiably and demonstrably connect our IT support towards the accomplishment of the future that the business has decided it wants to go. For instance, let's just say that the business decides it wants to be a data center provider. The CIO then has to plan what's it cost to run a data center and how many technologists are optimal at running data centers. We're the subject matter experts in this area. So my contribution to the business is to paint a vision on how to effectively invest in scalable solutions and expand those things over time to achieve the results the business has asked for. That is directly a CIO function. Let me just clarify, make sure I understand. The business is coming to you, Bob, and saying... This is where we want to go. And then then you're painting the vision of, of how to enable that. I think it's a little bit different. Okay. So I think it's got to go this direction. Actually, I, one of the leaders of the business, I work with the business to create and understand the strategy of the future. And then naturally, my leadership role says, this is what my contribution is going to be in changing, adjusting, and developing the CIOs, uh, the IT staff to accomplish the vision that the business wants to achieve. Through these investments, through this change, through these business systems that you've requested to allow you to morph and change your business, that's the CIO's role is to translate the corporate strategy into a technical strategy that delivers the right solution. Yes, that makes sense. And then where does the art of the possible come into play when you you were using that word earlier, which I love? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. The art of the possible, that's generally... How can you do the job with the people that you have with minimal training? That's the art of the possible. You frequently hear cutting-edge technology, bleeding-edge technology. Most of the technology, state-of-the-art concepts, those are not affordable in mid-margin businesses, and they're very applicable in research and development. However, they are not very applicable in sustaining, operating, and running an IT shop or IT support to a business. We have to be state-of-the-market. State of the art is so expensive, it pushes everything outside of a good business case to get the very best, the very uh, newest, and the very latest technology. It's much better to be in state of the market, centered on what the rest of the people in your space are using, and in technology that's mature to the point where it's stable enough, which doesn't take fixing every day. So, a CIO is responsible for knowing that. It's the difference between state of the art state of the possible, and then state of the market. Yes, I love that. That's a great way of saying it. I've never heard that said like that in the same way. So your role, and sometimes I like to break it into offense versus defense, but the funny thing is, is that if you can't do take care of defense very well with understanding and helping on the finance, it almost seems like the, a deeper financial sense that you've broken down earlier for us will actually help potentially create more offensive opportunities for you to be able to enable the business. Well, one of the key things that CIOs have a challenge with is how transparent can they be with their IT spend? And transparency requires dedication and focus. I'll tell you that for sure. 
One of the things that I do is I charge, but I actually categorize all the cost in IT from bottom to top on a spreadsheet, cost per person per year, cost per person per period, and percentage of revenue to the business. And objectively, you want to stay with inside of your market center or below just to be an optimal IT organization. Otherwise, you can't measure yourself for performance. And then it's just IT going in the bucket. You know, the cost of IT is a very expensive item. Here's the thing. The key thing the CIO has to do is do the IT for the business, ensuring that IT is not doing IT for IT's sake. So in order to do that, you start with a business financial concept. You work from an asset out to a capability, and then you do the accounting from the cost per service that you're delivering. When you do it that way, and this is the consistency I think every CIO office needs to start on, is to get those artifacts very consistently delivered so that you can have something shareable between one place to another. Right now, that's not the case. You go in a CIO office, it's different every place you go. Yeah, it's very different. And I think you're absolutely right that this this, uh, has to be something that's consistent. It's very difficult then to move from company to company and to be able to help an organization out without that consistency. You're saying we could start right at the individual level, not worry about the company, but worry about the individual CIO learning these skills. And where would they start, do you think? There are plenty of good educational programs out there. I was actually educated at the federal system at National Defense University. But, you know, Carnegie Mellon's got them. But they all have different syllabuses. There's got to be some consistency in the syllabus structure and educational offerings. When you go to one university to another, an MBA program is very consistent. When you go to one university today for a CIO program, it might be centered on software development and application development, whereas another university might be on asset management, project management, and program management. That inconsistency is creating this turbulence in our new profession called the CIO. So someone who's mid-career and that has been, I mean, there's just a ton of people, uh, Bob, that have been involved with from the early mid-90s that are really not that old and uh, they need to mature their skills and they need to do it real time. They need to do it real time. And and so I know there's a lot of on-demand courses out there, but if someone came to you and, and wanted to kind of build their skills to the next level, would you say like, go to Syracuse and take their online program or go to Carnegie Mellon? Um, or? No, the first thing I would do is I would tell them to start determining whether they want to be a CIO or not. <laughs> well, assuming yes, that they wanted that or they were already in the role. <laughs> well, here's the point. And, and I want to really be clear on this. I could tell you that I work with the business and almost every day they say, there's no way I would want to do your job. You know, you start to think to yourself, oh, well, then who's going to do my job when I get too old to do it? You know, the problem is this is a very hard job. You know, I wrote an article for CIO Magazine once, and, you know, my staff internally would take a single look at my day, and they don't want to be the CIO. And the reason is it's a hard job. It's complex. It's got depth. It's got every part of the business. And, you know, the reality is is that, you know, you can't be super successful at doing it unless you can manage true diversity, true challenges of a business. There's a couple of things that I think that CIOs must have. They've got to have analytical skill. They have to have financial acumen. And they got to become communication experts. If they can't do those three skills, then they're going to be handicapped. And the other piece is that you got to have a pretty varied rotational assignment plan of being in the business and out of the business and having some access to IT capital planning and IT value management programs. So you, I guess to really tell you, to be a full circle CIO, you have to spend some time in the technology services, delivering services to the business. And then from there, you got to go to the business and see how well the, the IT does support you. And then you can take that business experience and bring it back to the IT shop as a IT leader, CIO-like leader, and actually help shape the future of where the business can go with the best technology that has been best delivered. I think that's kind of what I would suggest. It takes rounding. And I think it's up to me to build a pipeline that's going to provide those rounding opportunities within the organization. So if someone's been a CIO for a while and needs rounding, and they need financial rounding or uh, analytics rounding, is there a place to go for that? 
Are we talking about someone who is a CIO today? Who is currently a CIO? Because whether or not they have the title, uh, some organizations, VP of IT or director of IT, depending if you're mm-hmm. association or not. I mean, there's so many different ways to, I'm using the metaphor CIO because not all organizations actually fully title someone as a CIO. Right. Well, I, I think the first thing is that, that you have to take some kind of training in information resource management, information resource management at the top level. You've got to understand what it takes to build a portfolio of capability and tie it to the financials that run the business. If you're a CIO today and you don't have the time or the inclination to go to train, then I would suggest you do this right away. Go find somebody you like in finance and kind of talk to them about how can you be more effective at using the financial system to help you run your business. They'll be glad to help you. You know, When you get to a company, it's generally a small place. You can find enough people to help you and get you savvy and then ask them what their ideas are to help make your system better to work with the leadership. I will partner with the, the line leadership and say, okay, guys, you know, I'm giving you this. Is this helpful? If it's not helpful, find something that is. But yeah. I still say it starts with this asset management. It talks about financial accountability and it talks about managing the investment portfolio and managing all of the IT systems as part of a total ecosystem that you can account for. If you can't do those things, I don't think you're really doing CIO work. If you're making applications that you can't tie to a business, then I think you're just an apps developer. Sure. I mean, that makes sense. And and I've actually heard that a couple of times that some of the CIOs that have, have literally gone over to finance and have sat down next to them and kind of partnered with them to close up some of their gaps. And that's worked worked well. Do, do you have a particular system that you use for managing portfolios or is it just Excel spreadsheet ultimately at the end of the day? Well, you know, this, the new tool that's coming up is uh, out of a company called Aptio. The first part is, is there's a couple of tools. One of them is Metis, True Metis. And that was the first architectural kind of aggregator of all the systems, you know, where you could build a, a map of the systems you own, and then you can actually start to tie it to a roadmap. What's the name of that? True Metis. It's called True, T-R-O-U-X. Okay. And the latest one that's come out, it's called Aptio. It's called a technology business management component. And it's probably closer to an ERP for CIOs than the Metis Enterprise Architecture Framework was. Okay. So that's the latest that's coming out. It has total cost accounting as its foundation. And I advocate that total cost accounting is the primary CIO's responsibility. So it maps up to what we're doing. And we're currently in pilot right now to see what value we can get out of the platform. Oh, that's great. That's a great uh, tip for people, the Aptio sure. tool set. And if you can run Aptio, you're running a CIO office. If you can run the whole module structure, figure so, out the cost to run, identify the ones. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons, Bill, that it's so important that we deliver this cost to run thing is you got to know what it costs to, to deliver a financial ERP because eventually someone's going to come to you and say, I think you ought to take that to the cloud and buy it as a service. Well, if you don't know what it costs to run, how are you going to figure out what we're going to the cloud is a better idea? Yeah, you got to compare it against. The cloud service, software as a service, keeps on giving, man. The bill is very high, and it's not going down. It's going to go up. And how do you manage that? How do you do a cost comparator based on the features available in a SaaS, the software as a service, compared to an infrastructure element? Yeah, there would be no way. keep on premise. It's tough. Yeah, that is tough. So that total cost accounting piece, so at least uh, current state, you need that balance sheet. So that would be in, important. Now, you've also mentioned the compliance role that you have as well. Are you talking about compliance from a regulatory compliance from that, that angle and, and a security compliance? Or, or is that something that, that SAIC has started to break out and now it's something separate from you? No, I'm talking about a total compliance regulatory requirement. You know, I'm responsible for ensuring the efficacy, the security, and the accounts access management for the key financial systems inside the company. So it's me, the CFO, and the CEO sign the document that goes to Wall Street. Okay. So, so I'm certifying the systems operate the way they're supposed to, they haven't been tampered with, and that the security controls put in place are viable and effective. So do you see that role changing at all in the future with companies with sort of the advent of the CISO role? Do you see that role uh, shifting for you in the future? 
No, the CISO's role is to safeguard the content and the data of the business. The CISO role is an actual oversight role. And generally, in my case, the CISO reports to me. So I'm the responsible person. Some places, I guess the CISO could be responsible for it, but he's not the top. He's not the top technologist in the business, usually. So that's where I find that fabric a little bit unconnected. Yeah, no, that, I think it's good to, to hear you, the way you view it, because I, I do see confusion right now with not only the pieces we're talking about being a, being a CIO, but then a completely brand new set of leadership emerging, but nobody's really sure where they're ultimately going to report up to the CIO or up to the CFO or to some other uh, structure. The CISO function is uh, limited, whereas the CIO function is all-encompassing. When I say that, if you if you got a CISO who's accounting for all the costs and the security and all the features, then he's running as a CIO. He's not really doing the CISO role solely. But if you you know the other piece is that in the CIO role, I provide a space for the CISO to operate, and the CISO does the security compliance checks over the systems. He actually makes sure they operate within accordance with the direction from the CIO and the company. And then they report back to the CIO, back to the CEO about how things work. And it provides an independent view. Some places it's put in the legal department, but because they don't have financial responsibility for the management of the investment, it's an incomplete role. The CIO's job is to do manage the investment. What do you, is your belief on the word innovation and the role of the CIO with innovation? Uh, is it something that you've formally thought about? Do you have a, a team that's really responsible for kind of uh, disrupting SAIC itself in the sense of constantly challenging uh, assumptions? Or what is your thought on innovation, that word, and, and its role within your organization? So within SAIC, and it is my job to be innovative when the business demands it. It's not my job to be innovative on a daily basis without demand. That's very important. I, I, want, I want to stress this. If I keep doing stuff for the sake of doing it because it's sexy IT or it's new innovative IT or it's new game-changing IT and the business doesn't need it or hasn't requested it, then I'm doing IT for the sake of doing IT. And that's not my job. My job is to align IT investment, innovative or otherwise. If the business says I want to do some innovation technology, it's up to me to build the business case of how to deliver that and how to deliver it in a fiscally responsible way. Most of the time... Innovation concepts are built and developed in IRED, in investment research and development. It's the CIO's job to take a valid, proofed concept to determine scalability within a business case. It could be the greatest thing since sliced bread, like an auto-driving car. But if it's not your core business, and that auto-driving car is not going to make you money, and I can't make every car in the United States do it, and that's what our mission is, then I shouldn't do the investment. I'm kind of like the gatekeeper for that kind of stuff. Innovation to me, it's not about what the CIO does every day. I mean, I can do innovation. I can be innovative in the practice. I can be innovative in leading technology. But innovation is when it gets mass adoption. And I am advocating innovation in training CIOs better in the future. But notice, that's not about being innovative on my platform. My job is to optimize the platforms continue to run the operations and maintenance to them. And when something game-changing comes out, nominate the candidacy to the business with the concept of determining its scalability and useless by everybody. Then I can install the new capability once the business itself decides they want that investment. If you do it without that business link, then you're just doing IT for IT's sake. You really think there has to be that strong business case really right. bringing on these ideas. And uh, so you're not necessarily testing. You, you don't have a group that's actively budgeted for that you're funding for for innovation. It's just sort of those ideas just come, in, come into your group and bubble up to you. And that's how you're managing it from that angle. Well, we keep track of all the technologies and we select the ones that we think will best support the business. Okay. The, this, the thing, and I think one of the things in your questioning, Bill, is kind of unusual is I'm not the IT guy. I'm the leader of technology investments for the business. I'm a business leader first and technology second. My job is to keep the business out of trouble in their spend of technology. Your job is to keep the business out of trouble in the spending of, of the technology. That that makes sense. Spending dollars on technology. That's correct. 
it's not to make, you know, I, I do make decisions based on where I think we should go with technology, but my primary job is I'm one of the business leaders in the C-suite that makes decisions on how to execute this business. Not just run IT. I'm not the IT guy. And the business leader responsible for controlling, operating, and running the technology investment, the second largest investment in the company after human capital. Key role. One of the things you talked about was owning problems last time we talked, and I thought that was a pretty profound statement that you made, Bob, on owning problems from beginning to end. And uh, would you be able to clarify for listeners what that means and, and then how it's made a difference for you in your career with this, this concept and this belief that you have? Absolutely. So here's a good example. Let's say a software company that you've been using all along, all of a sudden jacks its price 25%. Oh, that's a problem because your budget's kind of built on what it was last year plus an increment. If they exceed the increment, then you have to do a decision tree on whether or not it's the right solution for the business to operate. That's a problem. And for me to finish it, I could, I could just go to the business and say, well, you know, we're not going to deliver the service next year because they have to price by 25%. I don't have that luxury. I have to come up with a viable alternative or I've got to negotiate the fix on the problem that, that the company wants us to do in terms of decreasing that 25% into something that's either planned or reasonable. And, and really, it's up to me to just use my expertise to determine whether the value that they've added to the platform warrants the 25% or not increase in, in cost. Uh, that's called owning the problem at the end. Some CIOs will go, well, I have to turn this over to the board and let the board make the decision. Not in my world. That's abdicating my responsibility. That's what I'm talking about, owning the problem to the end. Fixing it, budgeting for it, designing it, implementing it, making sure people are trained to use it, and then delivering a solution that everybody can use and then putting it on roll and affecting the way 16,000 people operate, owning the problem to the end. The other part is identifying problems. Sometimes it may not even be the IT department's problem, but it could be enabled by technology and improved. And it's up to me, that is probably closer to the innovation side you're looking for in, in how a CIO interacts with its business. But the reality is, is my job is to diagnose and understand problem sets. And then from those problem sets, if there's a technology solution, if there is a good one that will make a difference in the performance, then we should nominate it responsibly, budget and plan for it, and then test case it out to see if it's going to make a difference before making the business buy the whole thing. I love that answer. I think that's very informative for people listening. And, you know, as we wrap up, Bob, is there a way that you can uh, suggest for the people listening that are CIOs and they recognize that it is a very uh, hard job and you've given very specific ideas on, and, and how to shore up weak spots that, that everybody listening may have somewhere, some way, shape or form. How do you stay at your best day by day, year over year, to continue to refine your skills? You clearly are at the apex of, of your career. How do you stay sharp and always fresh with these concepts? Well, first of all, I read uh, tremendous amounts. I, I probably read 15 to 30 hours a week extra after doing the regular job. And that's that's a lot. you got to keep abreast. You know, I'm always browsing the news site. The other part is partnering with other CIOs. And, you know, become, let's build a community that we all share lessons learned in and good ideas. And then let's keep those good ideas going. And then the last part is contribute of yourself. You know, I like to contribute to these concepts and forums because I think I'm responsible for defining the CIO program I'm going to leave behind in the future. And, you know, I want people to have an azimuth to go directly to where they want to get to be the best. I don't know if I'm the best, never claim to be. But boy, I will tell you, running around and chasing smoke and new ideas every day without a definitive guideline to go there, it makes my job hard. So by standing on two feet, establishing clear priorities, focusing on delivering consistent artifacts to the business, and understanding how to account for all of these things, to me, is the foundation core of what the CIO in the true information resource management concept needs to know. Now, I was educated at Syracuse with a federal CIO background. Carnegie Mellon has a program. I think Stanford has one as well, and so does uh, Duke. They're all good, 
they're leaving you to figure out what that azimuth is and what are the core components. I think we as CIOs should nominate core components. We should uh, be able to evaluate each of the different places you would go to get them and then provide clear guidance to the people that want to be a CIO of which ones are the best. And that's only going to happen if we choose to lead. If you want to follow, you could do that. But at the end of the day, we're responsible for what the next generation knows and doesn't know. And to me, that's a serious responsibility. Well, the three things that you mentioned were reading, and uh, you read 15 to 30 hours as far as helping you be the best leader. You can be 15 to 30 hours a week reading lessons. You you go and you share uh, your ideas with other CIOs, and I'm assuming different groups, and you contribute yourself right, through writing and through podcasts and other, and other areas. Right. As far as books, are they mostly books that you're reading or mostly websites, news, or is it just a variety of Well, different- there's books. There are books. There are technical publications. There are concepts. White papers are always coming out. There is one more piece. Become a mentor. You have to share these ideas. And one of the best ways to do that is through a mentor protege type program. I have one here. I take 12 people every six months from the business. I also mentor within CIO Executive Council on CIO.com Pathways program. I've done uh, four of those sessions. And then I also work at shaping the future path, you know, the CIO path of the future with CIO.com and other CIOs by shaping and designing what we're supposed to be doing. And we put that into a codified roadmap that a lot of CIOs have been following. It's how you grow and develop. The best part about doing the mentor program outside your company is you get a view into what others are doing. And that allows you to improve your internal game. So I do both internal and external. In in the past, I've taught at enterprise architecture and security architecture at Carnegie Mellon University. And I love doing that. I would like to do more of it, but the business demands are really harsh, so you can't do it all the time. But that's how you make a difference, I think, in the future. We have to chart it and do it, or otherwise people are going to do it for us, and we're not going to like it, especially if it's the business or the financial guys making the decisions for us. Oh, well, I think this is great, and I'm really looking forward to, to publishing this uh, this conversation because the wisdom you've shared and some of the really good tips for people are are, are tangible and really executable for people to to really raise their leadership uh, to the next level because you just didn't do it by standing around. It was really, really active and proactive approach, and, and I just love that message. Well, Phil, I appreciate the time to talk to you. Yeah, thank As you, always, Bob. have a great holiday, and uh, I hope this helps some people. Uh, absolutely, and Bob. Please, please share some feedback if you can. I will. I'm going to ask people to to leave their comments um, on uh, iTunes and also you're on uh, LinkedIn. Are you on Twitter by any chance, Bob? I am on Twitter. Well, maybe I'll, R- uh, R-F-E-C-T at Twitter. Okay, I'll I'll ask people to leave some feedback on Twitter as well on the on the show notes page, and so that uh, you can kind of see real time what people's uh, thoughts are, are regarding the show today. That would rock. Thanks Thank a lot. you, sir. Yeah, have a great day. Bye bye, Bob. So there you have it. That is a wrap for my conversation and interesting discussion with Bob Fechtow. I hope you all enjoyed it. Please leave comments on iTunes, leave comments on Twitter, leave comments on LinkedIn. Find the show and please leave comments. We'd love to hear. I would love to hear how you responded to this particular episode. It's my oxygen. I love it. So please reach out. It uh, it was always kind of a thrill to receive feedback from, from you. So with that, until episode 71, enjoy your day. Bye-bye. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.